Thank you. As I look out at all of you today, I feel that I'm looking at the future of the Jewish people in a city that is so important to our past. Basel is a city of dreams, big dreams. It was here, I think all you know, in 1897 that a young assimilated Jew named Theodor Herzl, just 37 years old, around the age of many of you here, stood up in a hall less than a mile from here, from where we are right now. And he shared his dream with the entire world. What a dream he had. After 2,000 years in exile, after 2,000 years of discrimination, destruction, and death, it was time for the Jewish people to end their exile. It was time to come home. Here is one of the crucial parts of Herschel's dream. He understood that Jews could not rely on anyone else to help them to build a land for themselves. Foreign governments could not do it. And people could not even wait for the Messiah. Jews would have to do this all on their own. Why Herzl? Why Basel? And why a Jewish nation in 1897? When the Enlightenment gave Jews in the great cities of Europe at that time, in Paris, in Berlin, in Vienna, a lifestyle they never imagined possible. These are very important questions that have direct links to today. Theodor Herzl was not unlike many of us in this room. He was a completely assimilated Jew in a non-Jewish world. He was born in Budapest in 1860. His parents were well off and they moved to Vienna when he was 18. He was educated in some of the best schools in Europe. It was a fabulous place for a wealthy young Jewish man in Vienna. There were concerts, restaurants, great restaurants. High society was open to them. The last thing on Herzl's mind was his connection to Judaism. To many Jews of that era, those old men with beards and their ancient rituals were the past. Assimilated Jews believed they were the future, and that future was unlimited. You know, you can go through life with relief that you know is true, but when the world sometimes has a nasty habit of shattering those beliefs. That's what happened to Herzl. It's what happened to me. I'm guessing that it happened to many of you in this room. Theodor Herzl's moment of truth took place in a courtroom in Paris. He had gone there in 1894 to cover for the Neue Press, a newspaper in Vienna, the trial of another assimilated Jew, Alfred Dreyfus, a French military officer falsely accused of treason. It wasn't the false charges or even the unjust anti-Semitic court that awakened something inside Herzl. It was the reaction of the crowds outside of the courtroom and throughout the enlightened city of Paris. Those crowds just weren't angry at Dreyfus. The trial unleashed an anti-Semitic wave that Herzl has never seen before 
and never thought possible. He heard crowds chanting, death to the Jews, not death to Dreyfus, but death to the Jews, all Jews. It was at that moment that Herzl understood that no matter how forward thinking a society was, no matter how, how cultured they were, anti-Jewish sentiment did not come from the individual. It was a national thing. It was ingrained. And the only way Jews would be able to free themselves of this hatred against them would be to live like everyone else, to have their own nation, to have their own army to protect them. In other words, to have control over their own destiny. It's called self-determination. And all people had it, except the Jewish people. Herzl wanted to have it as well. That's a pretty big dream. I once said, everyone has great dreams, but what separates the dreamer from the doer is turning that dream into reality, making it happen. There are few people throughout history that have done that. It's the mark of a great leader. Here's the amazing part of the story. Herzl thought it all through to the tiniest detail, and he came up with a plan for what we needed, the political and financial details necessary to reacquire their homeland, the agricultural settlements needed to feed the people, the fundraising, the immigration, and the social laws that were all necessary. Herzl even drew a picture of a flag for this new nation called Israel. It was a white, on a white background with a blue Jewish star right in the middle. He thought of everything. And it was here in this city that Theodor Herzl called together the first Zionist conference. He chose Basel because it was more open than many of the European cities. He wanted the conference to look like a parliament and he told all the participants to wear formal clothing for their first session. Remember what I said about big dreams? Herzl thought it all through to the smallest details. That first conference held on August 29th, 1897, had 200 participants, approximately the number here. Different countries gave us the, um, he gave us the Basel Manifesto with its famous four points. I'm quoting, I, I'm translating from German. I hope. <laughs> First, the settlement of Jewish farmers, tradesmen, and artists in Palestine. Not Uganda, not New York, not even Ukraine, but the eternal Jewish homeland. Second, the creation of a federation of all Jews everywhere, guided by the rule of law. Third, strengthening the Jewish consciousness and turning Jews into Zionists. And fourth, and the final principle, attaining the government grants necessary to accomplish the Zionist dream. That, that this is what took place here in Basel in 1897. It was one man's dream that awakened the people. A visionary dream that showed Jews who were living very good lives throughout Europe, that that good life wouldn't last forever if you are dependent on the kindness of strangers. Just do the math. 1897 is 36 years before Hitler took control of Germany. 1897 is 41 years before Kristallnacht. 1897 is 45 years before the Wannsee Conference. And 1897 is 48 years before the complete destruction of the European Jewish people and the murder of six million Jews. 1897 was, in, was, it was the year of the visionary. It took the trial of a falsely accused French military officer to wake Theodor Herzl up 
from his comfortable sleep. My guess is that there was something that awakened many of you in this room to that same dream. I know there was something that woke me up. Believe me, you could not have found a more assimilated Jew in New York City than me. It's very difficult. I was raised in comfort. I went to the best schools. Yes, I knew I was Jewish, but my Jewishness was the last thing I cared about. I went to synagogue twice a year. Good. But in 18, by 1986, when President Reagan appointed me to be U.S. Ambassador to Austria, something happened that I never, ever expected. I arrived right in the middle of the Waldheim affair. Kurt Waldheim, some of you may know, was the U.N. Secretary General who lied about his Nazi past. But instead of just retiring, he came back to his native Vienna and ran for president. He wasn't ashamed of anything. The Austrians were angry because the Nazi past of their entire country was exposed. They blamed a convenient scapegoat. They blamed the Jewish press for bringing this up. Here's what makes an anti-Semite. People could have some personal insight. They could look at themselves and say, what did we do wrong? Or they could blame their mistake on someone else. In this case, once again, they blamed the Jews. That was the first time in my life that I came across the truly ugly form of anti-Semitism. I didn't like it. I had two choices. I could be quiet and let it subside, just do my job as ambassador. In other words, go along with it, or I could fight it. The fact is, it made me angry, it made me furious. And in many ways, just like Herzl, I chose to devote the rest of my life to fighting it. So here's my question to each of you, every one of you. What was it in your past that brought you to this room? I'm sure that when you were a child, you never imagined being part of a conference of Jewish leaders in a city called Basel. I didn't. Was it something that you saw? Was it a book that you read? Was it something you saw on television or internet? I know something brought you here. Just like Kurt Waldheim brought me here to this podium. Sometimes it's many things. It wasn't just the Dreyfus trial that woke Herzl up. Yes, that was the spark that ignited the flame. But it was also centuries of pogroms throughout Russia and Eastern Europe that Jews had to endure. Every so often, the non-Jewish community would get angry. They would run out and kill Jews and ransack their homes. Then things would die down until the next time, and Jews just chose to endure it. Here's my question to all of you. What is the difference between the pogroms in Kishinev in 1903, where 47 Jews were killed, or Kiev in 1906, when 100 Jews were killed, and the Passover bombing in the Park Hotel in Atanya in 2002, that killed 30 Jews, or the Hasharon Mall bombing in 2012, 2001 that killed 100, uh, um, or the slaughter of four rabbis two years ago at morning prayers right in the heart of Jerusalem. Make no mistake, there's direct link between the pogroms a century ago and the terror of today. There's a direct link between the BDS movement that wanted to deny Jews the right to self-determination and the crowds that shouted outside the Dreyfus trial in 1894. 
My point is that there is direct connection between the Jew hatred of 2,000 years ago and 200 years ago and today. Here's the difference. Today, we have a magnificent and creative Jewish state that is strong and will defend Jews throughout Eretz Israel, as far as way as Africa and South, South America. There's the IDF that is strong and creative, an army, navy, and air force that is creative and motivated. And we have a World Jewish Congress that has tremendous reach across the globe, a World Jewish Congress that is fearless in its defense of Israel and Jews everywhere. We must never forget this because a lot of people made tremendous sacrifices to achieve this so that you can be here. So here is my next question. Why are you here? Why do we bring JDs from around the world to this place at this time? It wasn't just to give you a history lesson or to make you freeze to death. You are here for leadership training. Someday, not too far future, one of you will be standing up here talking to a group of Jews that haven't even been born yet. And just as there are links between the pogroms of the past and the terrorism of the present, there are direct links between Theodor Herzl and you. Herzl is the leader that you should emulate. You should study. The leader you should model yourself about. Because, as I said before, it's great to have a dream, but make that dream into reality. You have to do hard work. You have to work long hours. You have to devote your life to this. But trust me, there will never be anything you do in your life short of raising a family that'll be more important than we all have devoted ourselves to something much bigger than ourselves. So today, just as Herzl laid out the Basel Manifesto, I want to give you the six principles of the World Jewish Congress. And these are the principles I would like you to follow. First, we are one Jewish people, from the most, most orthodox to the most secular, from the most conservative to the most liberal. And we are strongest when we stand together as one people. Second, we must never be silent because we learn the consequences of silence. Third, anti-Semitism and anti-Israel sentiments are one and the same, and they must end. Fourth, no Jewish child should ever walk in fear. Fifth, we must call for a viable two-state solution, but it must be a two-state solution that protects Israel and the Jewish people and is resolved between the two parties only. And finally, number six, all of us owe peace to the next generation. We are, we are uniters and we choose the power of heal to heal over the call to hate. The problems we face in many ways are just as grave as they were in Herzl's time, especially when you consider that Iran is working towards attaining nuclear weapons at the same time it's calling for the destruction of Israel. We see growing anti-Semitism on the internet, in mainstream newspapers, and even in places like the British Labour Party. And we certainly see it at the UN, where Israel bashing seems to be the UN's first and only mandate. But we are prepared, and we are strong. You are strong, and we're preparing you. We may be small in number, just 15 million people in a world of two billion Christians, a billion and a half Muslims, and a billion Hindus. That's a tiny number, and our numbers, frankly, are dropping. But we are an incredibly creative people. Earlier this year, I gave the keynote address at the 500th anniversary of the creation of the Venice Ghetto. That was the first time that Jews were forced to live in a confined space. That's where the word ghetto comes from. It was an overcrowded, and unpleasant place, but within no time, the Venice Ghetto became one of the leading centers of book publishing in Europe. Christian patients 
came to the ghetto to see Jewish doctors. Wherever Jews go, and no matter how difficult the conditions, Jews never stop thinking. They create jobs, they heal disease, they educate, they make life better for everyone. You think it's an accident that Israel, a tiny nation of only six million people, is one of the world's leading centers for computer technology? Jews gave the world monotheism. Jews save lives, all lives. Jews make the world better. With their ingenuity, their music and literature, we make up less than 1% of the world's population, yet we have won 20% of all Nobel Prizes. I will happily take our 15 million creative minds over the billions elsewhere. My point is not to brag, tell you that we have to harness that creativity and tell the world that it's in their best interest to side with Israel. It's in their best interest to protect Jewish populations. When Jews thrive, everyone thrives. And that is what world leaders should understand. And many are starting to understand it. Countries like Russia, China, and India are strengthening their ties with Israel. World leaders are coming to Israel. Even former foes like Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states are now talking with Israel. We are not waiting for the future to overtake us. We're making our future. And that's where all of you come in. I'm so proud of each of you and every one of you in the, in the Jewish Diplomatic Corps. You are energetic, committed, and you will change things for the better. Remember, this is not your father's World Jewish Congress. We are thinking boldly, and like Herzl, we have a vision, and we're acting on that vision. Here is what I want you to take home. Choose optimism over pessimism. The Jewish people are not going to disappear. We have come too far for too long to just disappear. That's not part of God's plan. But like, like Herzl, we can't leave it completely in God's hands. He expects us to do the work as he has supplies us with the means. We use the Jewish brilliance and Jewish creativity to solve our problems. We also do the hard work. We will do what is difficult. We can never be silent. How many times have you heard someone say something negative about Israel and you said nothing, not wanting to defend anyone? That silence ends as of now. Speak up. Tell them their words are insulting and wrong. Don't worry about losing friends. You won't. And if you do, they weren't your friends, friends in the first place. You will do all this because you are leaders. You owe it to the leaders that came before you and brought you to this place. You owe it to the Jewish children not yet born. Finally, I want to leave you today with an old Hasidic tradition that says in every Jew, a flame burns. Sometimes that flame is covered with dirt and the person can't see it, but it's always there. It's always burning. All of you have to do is to dust it off and you'll find it. 35 years ago, when I served as US ambassador to Austria, I saw a group of Jewish children from the Soviet Union in a nursery school learning about their heritage for the first time. I can't really explain it, but those children moved me in a way that I was never moved before. Those children helped dust off that flame inside me. They helped me, me rediscover my Jewishness. And that's the job before us. We have to help our children and our grandchildren dust off their hearts. We have to help them rediscover that Jewish flame inside them. This isn't just important for Jews, it's important for everyone. Because for over 5,000 years, that flame has been lighting the entire world. This is my directive to all of you. Do not let that flame go out. We've come too far and the stakes are too high. You must dust off that flame in other Jews. You are leaders. You have responsibilities. I'm not asking you to be Herzl, but I want you to be like Herzl. Have a vision, work hard. Never stop defending the Jewish people. And someday when someone asks you why you've done so much, tell them, it was because of something that happened a long time ago in 2016 in Basel. 
and because of a man named Theodor Herzl. God bless his memory. God bless all of you in this room. And may God continue to bless the Jewish state of Israel and the Jewish people. Thank you all very much.